Hi, my name is Elise Bean. I'm the co-director of the Washington office of the Levin Center at Wayne Law. For nearly 30 years, I worked for Senator Carl Levin in Washington doing investigations. I even wrote a book about his work. What I'd like to do today is convince you of two things. First, that if you want good government, government that works, you need good oversight. And second, Congress, yes Congress, can do good oversight. So what I'd like to do now is give you some background about congressional investigations and then give you a couple case studies to show you what I mean. The Constitution assigns a lot of different responsibilities to Congress. They require them to legislate, to approve nominations, to decide how to spend money, even how to declare war. And if you're going to do those kinds of things, the Supreme Court has said Congress has to be able to investigate the facts. Now, the kinds of investigations that Congress does are different from those of the executive branch. Congress can't throw anybody in jail. They can't fine them. They investigate for a different purpose, to carry out the responsibilities under the Constitution. So they need to know facts in order to legislate, appropriate, approve nominations, and take other kinds of actions. Congress does a couple of different kinds of investigations. They look at what the government does, but they also look at what the private sector does. Both kinds of investigations are important because Congress might want to legislate on them, stop abuses, identify problems, and lead us to a more perfect union. So who does investigations in Congress? just about everybody. There are about two dozen committees in the House, another two dozen in the Senate, and all of them have subcommittees. They are actually required by law to do investigations into the issues within their jurisdiction. Sometimes Congress creates a special committee, a select committee, if there's some particular problem that they want Congress to investigate. Probably the most famous is Watergate. We did one after the 9-11 terrorist attack. So those, that's another type of committee that does investigations. In addition, every individual member of Congress has the responsibility to get the facts. They're going to be voting on spending, on legislation, on nominations. They need to be able to make an informed decision. So while members of Congress don't have the right to issue subpoenas or hold hearings, they too often do investigations. So let's talk about investigations. It's sort of an amorphous word. People don't really know what it means. We try to break it down into four phases. The first one is fact-finding. That's when you actually get the documents, talk to people, try to find out what actually happened. Second phase is writing it up, because if you don't write it up, no one else is going to know what you found out about. Third phase, if it's important enough, you have a public hearing. The fourth phase, which a lot of people forget about, is what we call the follow-up stage, actually doing something about the problems you've uncovered. So that's the four phases of an investigation. So what do we mean by good oversight? There isn't really any official definition or official measurement, but we've come up with four different ways to think about whether an investigation consists of good oversight, good high-quality oversight. First thing we think about is the quality of the investigation itself. Did you ask the right questions? Did you talk to the right people? Did you get the documents you really need? That's the quality of the investigation. A second factor we look at is whether the investigation was carried out in a bipartisan way. The reason that's important is if you investigate with somebody who agrees with you, it's like doing something with an echo chamber. You miss a lot. If you do an investigation with somebody who has a fundamentally different world view than your own, you're going to notice different facts. You're going to understand those facts differently. You're going to interpret them differently. You're going to think about different issues, different concerns. The end result is that the investigation you do is usually more accurate, more thorough, more thoughtful, and it's more credible because you did it with somebody who had a different worldview than your own. And in fact, that's our third factor for evaluating the credibility of an investigation. Is it credible? And for that, we look at third parties. Do other members of Congress think your investigation was credible? Do outside experts? Does the media? Does the public? If it's a good investigation, hopefully they will find it credible and they will take the findings to heart and do something about them. Now, you can have an investigation that is high quality, it was bipartisan, it was credible, but if you don't change public policy, to me, it's not good oversight, because the point of oversight is to change policy. So now I'd like to take a minute and talk about the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. We called it PSI. The reason I want to talk about it is it's one of the premier investigative bodies in Congress. 
It was created when Harry Truman was a member of the Senate. During World War II, they asked him to set up a subcommittee to look at waste, fraud, and abuse, and war profiteering during World War II. So he did that work, and he did it in such an even-handed, bipartisan, constructive way that they decided they need to made, make his subcommittee permanent. That's why we have that strange name, the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. Back then, subcommittees were created to do an investigation. When they were done, the subcommittee itself disappeared. But Congress decided that when he did such terrific work, they ought to have a subcommittee where the people on it had investigative skills and could be asked to look at complicated questions for the benefit of Congress. So that's PSI. It was created, it has no legislative jurisdiction, it doesn't write any of the laws, all it does is investigate. So PSI is known for having very broad jurisdiction. They can look at just about anything that they want to. In addition, what they're famous for is acting in a bipartisan way. Both sides always work together on all of their investigations. Another thing they're famous for is using case studies. They don't like to look at generalities or platitudes. They like to focus on specific case studies to understand what the real problems are in a particular issue area. They're also known for naming names. They don't talk about case histories without naming people. They actually name the companies, the individuals that they're looking at. And that helps you, again, really understand the facts. Senator Levin was the chairman or the senior Democrat on PSI for about 15 years. During that time, he had four different Republican partners, Susan Collins of Maine, Norm Coleman of Minnesota, Tom Coburn from Oklahoma, and John McCain from Arizona. Now, all four of his Republican partners, you could see them as sort of mavericks because they cared more about facts than they did about their party. And Senator Levin felt the same way. And in, uh, during his entire 15 years, he worked closely with his Republican partners on all of the investigations that they did. Sometimes he led the investigations, sometimes the Republican led the investigations, but they always did all of those investigations together. Over the years, uh, PSI developed a lot of different principles about how they would do their investigations. We call them the Levin Principles. There's a list I've shown you on the screen there. We're not going to go through all of them. You can get the book if you want to read all of them, but I just want to focus on two of them. The first one talks about applying the two-year rule. And what that meant was this. We only had a limited amount of time to do any investigations. We did maybe one to three investigations in an entire year. And when we were deciding on that investigations, one of the questions we asked ourselves, is this investigation worth two years of my life? Because that's usually how long it took. It often took even longer. And when you think about it that way, is it worth your talent, your time, you start to skip over a lot of stuff that doesn't really matter, the cheap shots, the political shots, and you say, what really matters? What should I be spending the next two years of my life on? So that was our two-year rule. And if we looked at investigation and it didn't hit that sweet spot, we would massage it or change it in such a way that we finally said, yes, this is something that is worth two years of our lives. Another principle I wanted to bring your attention to is one near the end, take on the tough guys. That was what Senator Levin liked to do. He said, PSI, we're made to fight lions. We're made to take on the big, tough problems. And of course, that's what made it fun. All right, so let's talk about the first case study. It has to do with credit cards. It happened because Senator Levin, one month, paid his credit card bill, but he made a mistake. He didn't pay $15 of it. The next month, when he got his bill, he owed the $15 of debt, but he also owed interest totaling $35. He said, how can I owe $35 on a $15 debt? Being a senator, he asked his staff to find out. So we did. We called up the credit card company and they explained it this way. They said, well, if you don't pay 100% of your debt, we go to the first day of the month, we look at what you charged, and then we charge interest on it. We add them together. On the second day, if you have another charge, we add that charge and we charge interest on the entire amount. And it compounds during the month. So by the end of the month, if you haven't paid 100% of your bill, we hit you with that interest charge for the entire month. We said, well, you know, why do you do it that way? And they said, well, nobody ever said we couldn't. But in fact, what they were doing is making you pay interest on debt that you had already paid. 
Senator Levin didn't think that was fair. And he said, well, if they're doing this, they're probably doing some other shady things as well. I want you to really take a deep dive into the credit card industry. So for the next year, we really went deep. One of the things we did is we put on the internet a request for anybody to send us a story about credit card abuses that they might know about. And believe it or not, we got over 2,000 responses to that. We hired interns who all they did was take in the various stories that came in, categorize them, so we could identify the biggest problems. Once we did that, we decided, okay, there is a serious problem here, and we decided to have a series of hearings. So we looked at Wesley Wanamaker. We decided to have him as our lead witness. I called him the wedding guy. Just before he got married, he decided to take out a new credit card. It had a limit of $3,000, but guess what? He charged $3,200, so he went over the limit. In response, the credit card company, which at that time was Chase, said to him, fine, now you have a penalty interest rate of 29%, and we're going to apply it to that debt. Not only that, we're going to hit you with an over-the-limit fee of $35 a month. In addition, on top of that, we're going to hit you with a late fee of $35 a month. Now, Mr. Watermaker said in response, well, I'm only over the limit now. I paid the $200. I'm over the limit now because of all of these extra charges. And I'm not late. I'm paying you every month. But yet you're hitting me with $70 a month in fees plus interest rate of 29%. By the time we caught up with him, on his $3,200 debt, he had already paid $6,400, and he still owed $4,400 with no end in sight. We thought that was abusive. He was going to be our lead-off witness for our hearing. In addition, at that hearing, the final panel was going to be the CEOs from three prominent credit card companies. And the reason Center 11 wanted to have them there was not to berate them, but because they were the decision makers. They were the people who could say, all right, if this is a problem, I can come up with a solution. You have somebody lower down in the, in the totem pole, they're like, thank you, Senator. I see what you're saying, but I'm going to have to take it back. With the decision makers there, Senator Levin could confront, the, confront them front on about what was going on. So at the hearing, so it's a couple of days before the hearing, it's about five days before, the Chase CEO has now been informed of the facts and what he's going to have to defend during the hearing. And what does he do? He has his staff call up Mr. Wanamaker and say, Mr. Wanamaker, we want to apologize. We had policies where we should have negotiated with you. We know you tried to negotiate. We, we didn't go along with it. We broke our own policies. You're free and clear. You don't owe anything new. Well, great for Mr. Wanamaker, but what about everybody else? We let the CEO know we were still going to have Mr. Wanamaker as our leadoff witness. About two days before the hearing, CEO still feeling uh, under pressure about how he's going to defend all this stuff, announced a new policy. He said, from now on, we're only going to charge you a late fee if you go over the limit three times. We won't allow it to go on for years at a time in unlimited fashion. Think about that. That CEO clicked his fingers and for 100 million account holders, all of a sudden had a more fair policy about late fee, about over the limit fees. We hadn't even had the hearing yet. That's the power of oversight. We actually had the hearing. Mr. Wanamaker gave his story. He was very convincing. Uh, when uh, later on camera, when a reporter asked him, what are you gonna do now, now that you don't have to pay all these fees? He said, I'm going to buy my son braces. I mean, what a witness, right? Meanwhile, we had the panel with the CEOs. They announced, all three of them announced new policies, improvements, more fair policies for their account holders, again, showing the power of oversight. But Senator Levin said, you know, as soon as the spotlight goes off, these CEOs could click their fingers and go right back to the way things were. I think we need legislation. Senator Levin decided to introduce a bill. At that time, Chris Dodd was the ranking Democrat on the Senate Banking Committee and he was also interested in credit card reform, so he picked up the Levin bill. It became a Dodd-Levin bill. At that time, it was an election. Elections have consequences. President Obama was elected to office. He had actually campaigned in part on credit card reform. In addition, the Democrats were a majority in the House, and they, they also elected 60 Democrats in the Senate, which meant they could overcome any filibuster. 
So all of a sudden the Democrats had all three uh, parts of the government under control. So they decided, among many other things, to do some credit card reforms, one of the earliest things they did. The House passed a very strong bill. They sent it over to the Senate. Senator Dodd was then the chair of Senate banking. He brought up the bill. All the Democrats voted for it. All the Republicans voted against. He was ready to take it to the floor when all of a sudden his ranking Republican, Senator Shelby at the time, said, I'm ready to negotiate. Now, Senator Dodd could have said, hey, I've got the votes, I'm going right ahead, but he didn't do that. He said, I'd rather have a bipartisan bill. We then had two weeks of crazy negotiations. Everybody had a suggestion for the bill, lots of changes were made. The end result was not quite as strong as the House bill, but it was still miles ahead of, where, of the status quo. So the Senate voted on it, passed it, the House adopted the Senate version, it went to President Obama, and he decided to have a Rose Garden ceremony to sign the bill. Yours truly got to go along with Senator Levin. When he was signing the bill, behind him stood a lot of not only Democrats, but Republicans, even Republicans who had voted against the bill in committee, but then supported it on the floor. And you know what? I was happy to see them there because a bipartisan bill is a better bill. It doesn't attract the kind of um, opposition that a bill does when it's passed by only one party. So the bill they passed was called the Credit Card Act, and it had a lot of terrific provisions in it. One of the provisions dealt with that problem we started with. You could no longer charge interest on debt that had been paid. It had a lot of other good aspects as well. One of the problems we identified is that a credit card company was hiking people's interest rates when they felt they were a greater risk. Even if the person had played by the rules and paid their bill on time without fail, credit card companies were hiking their interest rates. Well, you can't do that anymore. If you play by the rules and you pay your bill, a credit card company can no longer unilaterally hike up your interest rate. In addition, they have to give you notice, uh, a 45 days notice before they increase your rate. The new rate applies only to future debt, not existing or past debt. They can't uh, charge you more than three over the limit fees at a time. Uh, we also had a provision that said you can't charge a fee to pay your bill. And I have to say, I was responsible for that. It made me crazy that when I was about to pay a credit card bill, it was, I was nervous about sending in the mail because sometimes the mail is too slow, didn't want to get a penalty interest rate, so I would call on the phone. It was an automated system, and you could pay your bill immediately on the phone. You were being responsible. You were trying to pay your bill. But what the company started to do was charge you 5 10 even $15 to pay your bill. They made you pay to pay. That made me crazy. You can no longer do that. They were even starting to talk about charging you a fee to pay your bill on the internet. Think about where we would all be today if companies could charge you a fee to pay your bill. But under the law in, credit card, in the credit card world, you cannot charge a fee if you're using an automated system like the internet or an automated telephone system. So there are a lot of improvements that that bill made. Uh, in fact, a lot of the abuses that we had been hearing about for years abruptly faded away. We just didn't hear the same sort of uh, scare stories about how the credit card companies were treating people. Uh, a couple years later, I ran into one of the lobbyists for the credit card companies. We, we had remained friends despite uh, the investigation. And I said to him, hey, I'm not hearing about any abuses anymore. And he looked at me and he said, well, you know, Elise, guess what? We're still making money. Now that's the right kind of oversight. You want to cure the problems without hurting the industry. We all need credit. We all need credit cards. We wanted to get rid of the abuses, but not hurt the credit card industry itself. And today, it's as profitable as ever. That's good oversight. Case study number two, hidden bank accounts. We got into this investigation because two different whistleblowers walked through our doors. The first one was a guy from Liechtenstein. He had been hired as an IT specialist by the largest bank in Liechtenstein owned by the royal family called LGT Bank and Trust Company. He was not a banker, he was an information specialist, and they hired them to make them into a paperless office. So that's what he was doing. But along the way, he started to read the documents from the bank, and he was horrified to discover that they had bank accounts for corrupt officials, for what looked like criminals, and for a lot of rich people that seemed to be hiding their money in Liechtenstein. 
So he decided that once he had finished his uh, project and gotten paid, he made a copy of all the documents that he had seen in the bank. And he then went on a systematic tour of about 12 different countries telling them, I think I know about some nationals who have hidden bank accounts in Liechtenstein that you don't know about, and I'm willing to sell you the information. Germany supposedly paid him $5 million for the information that he gave them. He also came to the United States, went to the IRS. IRS policy is they won't pay you up front, but if they give you information that leads to them collecting new taxes, they'll give you a percentage of the tax they collect later on. So this gentleman came to Washington. The lawyer that was representing him knew about PSI, and, he, and the lawyer said to him, you know, the IRS is never going to tell any, anybody anything about this. If you want people to know what's been going on in Liechtenstein, you should go to PSI and tell them. So he came to our offices. He told us his story, and he gave us a copy of all the documents having to do with United States persons who had accounts at LGT. We didn't have any money. We got them for free, no strings attached. He said, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, these documents are so hot they were burning our fingers. We decided we would look at them, but we'd have to look at them later because we were doing another project at the time. Put them in a corner, continued our work. A few months later, a second whistleblower walked through the door. His name was Bradley Birkenfeld. He was an American born and raised in Boston. His parents had sent him to school in Switzerland. He liked Switzerland so much he stayed there and he did become a banker. He got into wealth management for very wealthy individuals. He worked for a couple different banks, ended up at one point at UBS. UBS is the largest bank in Switzerland and at the time was one of the largest in the world. He left that bank on less than amiable terms and he decided he was going to come to the United States and tell the Department of Justice what that bank was up to. Came to the U.S., talked to DOJ, also came to our doors and he said, I'd like to tell you the same story. I can't do it on a voluntary basis, but if you give me a subpoena, I'd be happy to tell you the story. And we're like, friendly subpoena, we can do that. We gave him the subpoena. We then had an interview, lasted seven or eight hours. And what he told us is that UBS, UBS was also engaged in opening up accounts that people did not know about. So we decided to combine these two stories together and have a hearing about them and really an investigation into how banks and tax havens were helping U.S. persons cheat on their taxes. So what we found out about, L so we went back to the LGT documents. The first problem we had is that they were all in German, Liechtenstein German. I looked around the office, I said, did anybody take uh, you know, German in college? Two people had. They were able to uh, translate the documents enough to identify sort of the two dozen juiciest accounts. They were uh, people who had a lot of money and it looked like they had very interesting uh, fact patterns in the memos from within LGT. We then took those particular accounts and we went to the IRS and we said, IRS, we happen to have these documents. We don't know if you have them as well, but we're just guessing that if you do, you don't want two different translations out there in the world. We think if perhaps you could help us with these translations, then uh, we'll all be working from the same documents. Sure enough, they translated the documents for us so that we had solid translations, and boy, they were terrific documents. We then went around the country, we interviewed the account holders. All of them had already been contacted by the IRS. They were already, already lawyered up. We were sort of just the latest shoe to drop. And we found, let me give you an example, um, a guy in Florida, he was a contractor in the construction business, and he had made a number of trips to Liechtenstein, and by the time we looked at his account, it had $49 million that had never been declared to the IRS. At the time that we contacted his family, he had recently died, and his sons had taken the position with the IRS that they didn't know anything about this account. Unfortunately for them, the bank documents recorded times when they visited the bank in Liechtenstein, these are the sons, and they'd actually signed documents directing how the fund should be invested. So that didn't really hold up. Those were the kinds of people that we looked at. When we talked about UBS, what Mr. Birkenfeld told us is that UBS had a regular program of sending their bankers to the United States, and they'd come in often on a tourist visa. And they were going to places like yachting races or art venues, places where rich people gathered, and they would quietly hand out their 
business cards and say, if you ever want to open up an account that's confidential, let us know. And they had actually been doing this on a regular basis, servicing a lot of different clients in the United States. To make a long story short, it turned out that they had 52,000 accounts that had never been declared to the IRS with about $20 billion, that's billion with a B, of assets that the tax people had never been told about. So we had a terrific investigation. We had individuals, we had accounts at LGT, and then we had the large numbers and the large amounts of money from the UBS story. We had the hearing. Um, we said to UBS, you know, we can subpoena your CEO here in the United States because you have a big presence here, but really nobody in the U.S. did any of this stuff. It's all your colleagues in Switzerland. You really ought to send us somebody from Switzerland. And to uh, our surprise, and uh, we were very happy about it, they did send us a Swiss senior official. He showed up at the hearing. He had his $2,000 suit, his gorgeous hair. He looked like James Bond, perfect uh, you know, English accent, uh, perfect English with a slight Swiss accent. And when he sat down, the first thing he said is, UBS wants to apologize for our conduct in the past, and we promise we'll never do it again. We had had no warning that UBS was going to make that kind of admission. I was so surprised, I sent Center 11 a little note. It said, uh, wow. But of course, we're on TV, our faces didn't change. Center 11 took the big stack of tough questions he had, he put them to the side and he said, tell me exactly what it is you're apologizing for and what exactly it is you're never going to do again. And the witness admitted that UBS had in fact been sending people over here to open up secret accounts and they promised that they never again would open up an account for a U.S. person without telling the IRS. They also said that they were prepared to turn over a number of names of individual Swiss accounts to the tax authorities and to the Department of Justice. That was the first time there had ever been that sort of public crack in the wall of secrecy in Switzerland. Switzerland had been known for its secrecy and for the first time they were turning over names to the Justice Department. Well, you can imagine our hearing was just an earthquake in the offshore world. Uh, it really had huge reverberations. One of the things we did as a result of it is we went to Credit Suisse, the second largest bank in Switzerland, and we said, are you doing it too? And they're like, yes, yes, we're doing it. And we said, well, we don't see any point in having a hearing now. Clean it up, and we'll just go from there. I should tell you, a few years later, someone told us that Credit Suisse never actually got around to closing their accounts, and we ended up doing a full-blown investigation of them as well. What we discovered is they had 20,000 accounts for Americans that had never been disclosed to the, uh, to the IRS with about $12 billion uh, in hidden assets. So they were doing it just as well. We found a Credit Suisse um, uh, an American with a Credit Suisse account, and we asked him to describe what happened to him, and he talked about how he'd been approached in the United States, and then at one point he decided to go to Zurich and go to their headquarters. And they brought him into the headquarters, and he was ushered into an elevator with no buttons, and went up to a floor, and it opened up, and everything was white. And he was brought into a room, and everything was white. Obviously, they were selling secrecy. That's what was going on. He said after he opened up the account that day, his banker would appear in his home city every couple years. Uh, they would go to an expensive breakfast. Uh, the banker would pass him a magazine. It was usually Sports Illustrated. He would open it up, and there was his bank statement, not with his name on it, but showing how much money and how did the money had been invested and all of that. So that's what was going on on a wide-scale basis in the United States. And just to let you know, we didn't just look at foreign banks that were opening up hidden accounts for U.S. persons. We also looked at a couple of U.S. persons who created foreign entity, offshore entities, and opened up accounts in the names of those foreign entities in U.S. banks. The people that we looked at in particular, we had the uh, that had the most interesting investigation were Sam and Charles Wiley from Texas. These were two brothers who were real live businessmen who really made uh, terrific businesses, made a lot of money, but they didn't want to pay their taxes. So what did they do? They created a network of 58 offshore trusts 
and corporations where they sent money to them. They actually sent $190 million worth of stock options, gave them to various companies and trusts, then had those sent messages on a regular basis. What they did is they had their family lawyer become their trust protector. So that is the person who dealt with the trust, the offshore trust, and they would send recommendations to their family lawyer who would then communicate those recommendations to the offshore trust companies. And they say, for example, we'd like you to exercise these stock options, get a hold of the stock. We want you to sell some shares. We want you to take some other shares, use them as collateral for a loan, and start to invest that money. We found that over a 13-year period, the offshore trusts always took those recommendations, did exactly what they were asked to do, and never did anything but what they were asked to do. So of course it was all really a sham. These offshore trust people were not the businessmen that the Wiley brothers were, and they actually turned that $190 million into $700 million that we were able to trace over that 13-year period, never paying any taxes on any of that money. They then used their offshore entities, which had names like Devotion and Elegance, uh, very strange names, but they would have them open accounts in U.S. banks and securities firms and put in money and then use that money to invest in the United States. So we had hidden bank accounts going in a lot of different directions. Our investigation was done for policy purposes, but the facts we uncovered were so intense that a lot of enforcement actions followed. UBS ended up paying $750 million fine for all of the accounts that they had opened up, and they actually ended up turning over about 4,500 clients to the IRS. Now, to me, 4,500 names out of 52,000 wasn't impressive, but everybody else seemed to think it was cataclysmic that Switzerland actually turned over all of those names. Credit Suisse got caught about five years later, because our investigation was later, and even though they had fewer accounts and less money involved, the tolerance for that sort of conduct had decreased. They ended up paying a fine of $2.5 billion, actually it was $2.6 billion, and they actually closed all of those accounts. The Wiley brothers also became the subject of a securities fraud action. It was a jury trial which convicted them. They said that they had hidden their um, ability to, to control these offshore entities, and they did it for the reason that they were trying to avoid the payment of taxes. Uh, the court at that time decided to measure uh, a fine for them according to the taxes that they generally avoided and hit them with a $300 million fine. The Wileys were so outraged they decided to get cute. They went to bankruptcy court and declared bankruptcy, even though they had been on the Forbes list of the 400 most wealthy individuals in the United States. They declared bankruptcy, identified their creditors as these offshore entities that they secretly controlled. What they didn't realize is that when you go to bankruptcy court, guess who's number one in line? The IRS. The IRS finally said, okay, we've had a jury trial showing that you put this money offshore, that you controlled it, that it was a certain amount of money. We're now gonna go back all 13 years. We're gonna figure out how much money you never declared on your taxes. We're going to have penalty and we're going to have interest. And guess what? They hit them with a judgment of $3 billion, the largest ever against individuals. The court reduced that amount of money down to $1.1 billion, but they now owe, have a judgment against them for $1.1 billion. The Wileys ended up paying the $300 million fine for their securities fraud. They're continuing to contest the billion dollar tax assessment. Now, as I've said before, Congress does not investigate in order to take actions like throw somebody in jail or hit them with a fine. They do it for policy reasons. And there were some very important policy outcomes from that investigation into hidden bank accounts. The most important one was taken by the Ways and Means Committee in the House and the Finance Committee in the Senate. They got together and passed a law called FATCA, which is the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. I think of it as fat cat without the T. FATCA. And what that law said was this, to every foreign financial institution around the world, if you open up an account for a U.S. person and you don't tell the IRS and we find out about that account, you, foreign financial institution, are going to be hit 
with an excise tax of 30% on your earnings in the United States. Now, foreign financial institutions around the world almost always have U.S. Treasuries and U.S. stocks and bonds. That's because U.S. dollars keep their currency value better than any other currency around the world. And treasuries and certain blue chip stocks and bonds keep their value better than a lot of other investments around the world. So there's a lot of money that foreign financial institutions have here in the United States. So this was no, no empty threat. We could grab that 30% excise tax before those, the money from those investments left the United States. Now, when they introduced this bill, they had a hearing on it, and five months later, it became law. What happened to our dysfunctional Congress? How was that possible? Well, one of the things we found out is that U.S. banking industry was quietly supporting the bill. They were sick and tired of their wealthiest clients leaving them and opening hidden bank accounts in foreign banks. They said, you know, when you're in the United States, you have to disclose every account to the IRS. It's those 1099s. They said one to you, to the account holder, and one to the IRS. They wanted foreign banks who had U.S. persons as account holders to have to do the same thing. And under FATCA, now they have to. They filed 1042s. Now, the foreign banks uh, around the world didn't even hear about this legislation. And when it became law, they were shocked and outraged because here are their best clients with these hidden bank accounts and the game was over. They tried to stop it, they howled, they yelled, they complained, but because it had already become law and the U.S. banking industry was supporting it, they couldn't overturn the legislation. It took about, we passed that law in 2010, it took about six years to build the infrastructure around the world for foreign financial institutions to report their U.S. accounts to the IRS every year. But they did it. Along the way, other countries said, now wait a minute, U.S., all of our rich guys have accounts in U.S. banks, in Europe banks, and we don't know about them. They're hidden from us. How about you telling us about those accounts? U.S. said, you know what? You're right. And they passed a regulation to require U.S. banks to start reporting those accounts to the IRS. Before that, the banks only reported accounts opened by U.S. persons to the IRS. Now, under that new regulation, they report all accounts to the IRS. And, then the IR and they do it by country, the country that the account holder says they're associated with. So now the U.S. can exchange information with foreign countries. You give me information about my nationals, I'll give you information about your nationals. The rest of the world said, wait a minute, forget about the U.S. What about the Germans who have accounts in Liechtenstein or Italians have accounts in Switzerland? What about all of them? Let's get together and do our own FATCA-style system with common reporting standards so that we can exchange information about large bank accounts. And they went ahead and did it. And now over 100 countries have signed up to common reporting standards, and they are now starting to exchange information. The real exchanges of information started in 2016 in FATCA, picked up steam in the common reporting standards in 2017. And so we have a very new system that we didn't have before these series of hearings. For the first time ever, tax authorities around the world are getting information about large bank accounts. Now, when you think about it, why should only the tax authorities be able to see these large bank accounts? What about people who are fighting corruption or drug trafficking or human trafficking? Why shouldn't they be able to see these large accounts as well? So the battle continues to try to allow more types of law enforcement access to those kinds of accounts. So again, we have a case of oversight by Congress leading not to just changes in the United States, but changes worldwide for greater transparency in the financial realm. So now let's go to case study number three. This is our last one. And this ha is another tax one because Senator Levin said, okay, we had this investigation about individuals hiding money abroad, but I'd like to take on the biggest tax evaders of all, U.S. multinational corporations. 
Now, I have to tell you, none of us wanted to be a tax lawyer. We didn't want to do this investigation. None of us on staff knew anything about corporate tax law, and we didn't really want to. We held Senator, law, Senator Levin off for a couple of years. But eventually he said, all right, you don't get to investigate anything else. We're going to look at multinational corporate tax evasion. And we ended up doing a series of three hearings. Our most famous has to do with Apple. And this is what we found out. Apple set up three subsidiaries in Ireland. The one on top is called Apple Operations International, which owned Apple Operations Europe, which owned Apple Sales International. When it set up those companies, there was no there there. They had no employees. They had no office. They were simply shell entities that were controlled by people in California. And the reason they did this is because they wanted to use a quirk in the law. The quirk was this. In the United States, we tax companies that are formed there. Well, these three subsidiaries were formed in Ireland, so they weren't taxable as U.S. corporations. Now, in Ireland, they have a different rule. They say we tax corporations that are managed and controlled in Ireland. But these three entities didn't have any employees there. They were obviously managed and controlled from the United States. So what did Apple conclude? They weren't tax residents anywhere. The holy grail of corporate tax dodging. Now the way we found out of this was kind of interesting as well. Um, as part of our effort to find out about multinational corporate tax practices, we sent out a survey to a bunch of companies. And one of the companies was Apple. And one part of the survey said, please identify all of your offshore entities tell us where they were formed, tell us where they're tax resident, and give us a sentence about what they do. Well, we noticed in this list that there were these three Irish companies formed in Ireland, but the, uh, there were blanks about where they were tax resident. And we thought it was just an oversight, they just hadn't filled it in. So we're having an interview, and our chief investigator, Bob Roach, uh, said to the Apple uh, tax division guys who were there, so uh, where are these guys tax resident, these three Irish subsidiaries? And they looked at each other, and they looked at the ceiling, and they looked at their shoes, and when we didn't let the question go, they finally admitted they were not tax resident anywhere. So we knew Apple was going to be the feature of our next hearing. Now, at the time, we knew that just knowing the simple fact was not enough. You really have to understand the context and what was going on and why this worked. So this is what we found out, greatly simplified. Apple had stores all over the world. They decided that for a certain number of these countries, they were going to direct the money to the Irish subsidiaries. So what the first thing they did is they entered into an agreement with the Irish subsidiaries to Apple Sales International. And what they said is, you have the right to control the sale of our patented products. So if you sell an Apple uh, phone or an Apple iPad or any of that, whoever sells it has to pay a royalty fee to you in Ireland. So that meant all the Irish all of the uh, Apple companies, let's say you had an Apple uh, company in Germany or Kenya or Vietnam, when they would sell their Apple products, they would have to pay a royalty fee for each one of those products to Apple Sales International in Ireland. And guess what? The Irish subsidiary set that royalty fee just high enough that it essentially sucked all the profits out of each country. So when the German tax authorities would say to the Apple store, hey, you sold a billion dollars worth of Apple phones, where are your taxes that you're paying on those profits, they would say, gee, sorry, I don't have any profits because I had to make this huge payment to Ireland. So I don't have any profits here, no taxes to pay you. Isn't that convenient? What we found is over a four year period, those uh, sales uh, in certain countries around the world totaled $74 billion that went to Apple Sales International. $74 billion. Out of that $74 billion, uh, ASI sent $30 billion to the top of the chain. That was Apple Operations International, which never filed a tax return in any country. Apple Sales International, meanwhile, had entered into a sweetheart secret tax deal with Ireland. Ireland essentially said, again, greatly simplifying, that 
you have to pay tax on the phones and the, uh, and the products you sell in Ireland, sales tax, but you don't have to pay anything else. So out of that, in one year, that amount of sales of phones in Ireland was so small compared to the sales in the rest of the world that Apple's effective tax rate was 0.0005%. Not zero, but pretty darn close. That's what was going on. We made that information public in a hearing that we held in the Senate. Senator Levin uh, called in Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, the head of his tax division, and some other individuals as well, and just went through these facts. Apple's position in response to the facts that we laid out before them is, we pay all the taxes we owe. What they didn't say is they felt they didn't owe very much, hardly anything at all. Senator Levin thought that that sort of tax dodging, while it may have been illegal, it may have been legal, but it wasn't right no matter what. Senator Levin's position was, these three entities in Ireland with no employees and no there there were really just shams and all of their profits should have been attributed to Apple in the United States and US taxes should have been paid. But the IRS did not respond to that. When I talked earlier about our hearing leading to enforcement actions, in this case, the IRS took no action. They didn't try to collect any of that, any tax on that $74 billion. I don't know why. Perhaps it was because they felt they wouldn't get sufficient political backing to take on such a powerful corporation. But luckily, not everybody felt the same way. The key office is the European Union Office of Competition. They were already upset about Ireland because Ireland has the lowest corporate tax rate in the European Union, 12.5%. And they said to Ireland, gee, you couldn't even collect the 12.5% from Apple? You have to give them a secret sweetheart tax deal that nobody else knows about where you're uh, allowing them to pay less than 1%? The whole point of this is that's unfair to Apple's competitors because they cannot compete with somebody who has an artificially low tax rate like that. So the competition office went, over, uh, went back 10 years, which was as much as their law allowed, and they calculated the taxes that Apple should have paid at the 12.5% rate in, that was in effect in Ireland, and they added interest and uh, uh, perhaps some penalties too. I'm not sure about that, but the end result was they said Apple should pay taxes totaling $14.5 billion. The office also said, by the way, the United States, if you think any portion of those taxes should have been paid to you instead of to Ireland, just let us know and we'll try to work something out. The United States didn't say anything. Instead, the United States complained that the European Union was trying to collect the 12.5% rate that was the statutory requirement under Irish law. So Apple and Ireland have appealed that decision and it is still under dispute as of the time of this recording. A decision is expected any day as to whether Apple actually has to pay the $14.5 billion. In the meantime, Apple had so much money offshore from this and other types of um, activities that they were able to put the $14.5 billion into an escrow account under the control of the European Union and they get a guaranteed rate of return, which don't even get me going on that one. But that's a situation today that we have a company as profitable as Apple that is trying to pay little or nothing in taxes to any of the countries where it's doing business. Again, oversight by Congress is really intended for policy purposes, and we did have a policy result apart from an enforcement action with respect to Apple itself. The OECD, which is an international organization of a number of countries, including the United States, decided to start with a, a tax project looking at multinational corporate tax dodging. They called it the BEPS project, which stands for Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Project, the BEPS project. Uh, all of the countries in the OECD agreed within two years to a whole range of actions to take to examine this problem of multinational corporate tax dodging. They had 15 different action items. Action item number 13 had to do with just getting the facts. When we began to look into multinational corporate tax dodging issues, 
I was amazed to find out that multinational corporations have never told anyone anywhere around the world on a country by country basis where they do business, what profits they earn, and where they pay taxes and how much. They've never told anybody that. In our investigation, it took us almost a year of intensive effort to find out what Apple was doing in a four-year period. But now, under Action Item 13, all of the countries in the OECD have agreed that for their largest corporations, in the case of the US, it's corporations making more than $850 million in revenues per year, are going to have to file an annual form with their tax authorities disclosing some basic facts. For every country where they do business, they're going to have to identify the number of full-time employees, the kind of investments they've made there, capital investments like factories, how much money they've earned or lost there, how much taxes they were assessed, and how much taxes they actually paid. First time ever, large multinational corporations were going to have to cough up that information to tax authorities. So the U.S. passed a regulation to put that into place, as did many other countries in the OECD. And in June of 2018, for the first time, corporations filed those forms, and there was an exchange of information among the tax authorities of the OECD. They did the second exchange in June of 2019. So this is very new. It has never happened before. And if you really want to go after multinational corporate tax dodging, you really need to start with the facts. And nobody had the facts, but for the first time ever, we're starting to get the facts on a country by country basis. Now there's many people that said, you know, all of this information again, like with FATCA, is only going to the tax authorities. What about the policymakers? What about members of Congress who are writing the tax laws? Shouldn't they be able to see this information? What about academics who might want to analyze what's going on, even identify mistakes? What about the entire corporate community to find out what's going on? So there's an effort right now to make those reports go not just to the tax authorities, but to make them public. That's an, a fight, that, a battle that's still going on. But again, I want you to think about how oversight contributed to this end result. We had a series of hearings looking at several different corporations. We looked at Apple, Microsoft, Caterpillar, Hewlett Packard. We showed what they were doing. We didn't try to determine whether they broke the law or not. We just factually tried to show what they were doing on a bipartisan basis. We published those facts, and we started a conversation around the world about what should be happening. And now we've made progress. We're starting to get facts and countries around the world are starting to say, you know, these corporations are playing us all for chumps. They need to contribute to the places where they do business. When corporations want infrastructure, they want law enforcement, they want courts to protect their patents, they need to contribute to society. And congressional oversight has contributed to that conversation. So I hope that I've now convinced you that you need good oversight to have good oversight to have good government, and that Congress is capable of doing good oversight. I hope I've shown you that Congress can do investigations in a bipartisan, fact-based way. We can bridge political divides. We can find out complicated facts, and that can then provide a foundation for finding solutions to some of our serious problems. Now, you know, the media doesn't like to report on these kinds of investigations because it doesn't fit their picture of Congress as dysfunctional. And there are many times where Congress does have hearings, oversight hearings, that are not bipartisan and are not fact-based. Those do happen. But what doesn't get reported is a lot of the time Congress is doing very bipartisan, fact-based investigations on important issues that lead to corrections to problems. And I hope that gives you a little hope in your government as well, because Congress can do this very important oversight and can help drive us to a more perfect union. Thank you for listening and I hope uh, that you as members of the public, the academic community, the policymaking community, that you demand Congress do good oversight, fact-based, bipartisan, 
and high quality. Thank you for listening.